inspirational, uh, inaugural, sorry, holder of uh, Stanley Lewis Chair in Modern Israel. And his most recent books uh, are Herzl, Theodor Herzl, The Charismatic Leader, it came out in 2020, and Zionism, An Emotional State, which is forthcoming in 2023. Uh, also acknowledged kinship, post-colonial studies and the historiography of Zionism, also forthcoming in 2023. Uh, uh, which is a uh, work co-edited with Stefan Wacht and R. R. E. S. Sapochnik. Where's R. E. Where's my co-editor? Yeah. yeah. Co-editor, yeah. Yeah. Uh, and we're all looking forward to uh, reading um, these works. And today, Professor Penzler uh, is going to present a project he's currently working on. This is a global history of 1948, <coughs> which helps us move beyond this conception, uh, prevailing conception of Israel as, as detached uh, from you know, different regional and global developments. Uh, and we're really looking forward to your talk today. Um, the floor is yours. Okay, thanks very much. Thank you, Aviat. Thank you all for coming. And thank you again, Arye, especially for the invitation and making this all possible and the wonderful hospitality and just all the intellectual opportunities I've had for conversations here. It's been terrific. Um, so what I'm going to do today is something that no professor without tenure should ever do. Um, I'm going to be giving a talk on a project that I've barely begun. Uh, my sabbatical began in July of last year. I actually spent part of the summer finishing the previous book, the one that's coming out in a couple of months. And then I jumped immediately into this project. And I've had only several months to think it through, to gather material. I'm still very much, this is Perrault Bosser, so much so Bosser that it will blunt your teeth. Um, but this is actually the best time for me to give papers because I can listen to your and profit from your comments, critiques, suggestions about how the, um, about the form that the project uh, can take. I mean, I'm starting with a question. Uh, the question is, what does the world really make of what's happening in Palestine during 1947 to 1949? And to what extent are narratives created or expressed in real time during the war perpetuated after the war? And uh, to what extent is, as it were, the war in 1948 already the 1948 war? Uh, and you, know, you can imagine being a historian, I like to think in terms of constructed narratives. And so much of what the world came to think of as the 1948 war is constructed after the fact. So I start with um, Arthur Kessler on June 7, 1948. Kessler was in Tel Aviv reporting for the Manchester Guardian and preparing material for his book Promise and Fulfillment. And on that day, he wrote in his diary, it is certainly the most improbable war that modern history has ever seen. The small voice of the leaders of this Lilliput state is drowned by a worldwide echo. The puny facts created here throw enormous shadows. The cliches of the front page reportage are overloaded with historical associations. On the one hand, holy jihad and the Arabian Nights. On the other side, the Bible and the Maccabeans. Each hill or vadi where the Sten guns bark has either sun, seen the sun stand still in Joshua's day or a miracle performed by Christ. Reality is swallowed by archetype. Kessler's colorful prose captured the passion that the world's Christians, Muslims, and Jews, over 40% of the world's population at that time, brought to the Palestine question during the years immediately following the Second World War. These passions dated back centuries if not millennia. But the struggle for Palestine also attracted, and for the first time, the interest of countries such as India and China, which lay outside the zones of Abrahamic civilization. The onset of the Cold War and decolonization globalized the Palestine question. But responses to that question were fractured along national lines and reflected state interests more than religious sensibility. And so my talk today sketches out the main questions underlying my current book project, which places the diplomatic and military struggle for Palestine between 1947 and 1949 in a global context. The book's goal is to decenter the war, but thereby to recenter it, to situate it in a post-war world engulfed in conflict. The Palestine question was, of course, of the most immediate and paramount concern in the Arab and Muslim worlds. The second world's big three, the United Kingdom, United States, Soviet Union, all had deep interests in the matter, but it was always linked with broader strategic interests. But we have to bear in mind that the Palestine War 
occurred alongside of civil war in China, revolution in Indonesia, post-war recovery and incipient Cold War rivalry in Central Europe, and other global crises. The United Nations, as we know, devoted considerable time and effort to the Palestine question, but only if we consider the activity of the organization as a whole over this period can we truly appreciate how actors at the time perceived the war and its significance. Now, this audience does not need to be told how exhaustively this period, 1947 to 1949, has been studied. Hundreds of monographs about it, and you might be saying, good Lord, do we need another book about it? Good question. Most historians of the war approach it from the perspectives of military and diplomatic history, although scholars, particularly in Israel, have done pioneering work through the lens of social history, tracing the course of the war and its impact on fighters and civilians on both sides. I want to make it clear I'm not trying to contribute to what's already been done so well. What is missing is a global history that takes into account the relationship between the war and post-war geopolitics, and a book that does not yet again focus on the United States, the Soviet Union, right, and Britain, but looks at an international community of, you know, 58 countries in the United Nations in 1947. So, Also, the project extends beyond elite actors to encompass public opinion in journalism and other forms of popular writing, and the mobilization of support for Israel and the Palestinians by Jews and Arabs worldwide, so lobbying in Latin America or in Canada or wherever it is. So let me talk a little bit about the historiography as it exists now. Um, you know, the period I'm talking about between 1947 and 49 is the twilight period between the era of British and French imperial hegemony and the onset of decolonization. I'm hardly the first to make that observation. It was made by Walter Lecour in 1975 and then a little later by Paul Johnson. As Paul Johnson evocatively put it, Israel slipped into existence through a crack in the time continuum. There's also very good scholarship on how in the United States and Western Europe, opposition to Israel's creation came from senior figures in industry and government. And we know this particularly from a very important monograph recently published by Jeffrey Herf about how um, American security services, for example, and the State Department connected the nascent state of Israel with pro-Soviet communism, a mistaken view, uh, but nonetheless, um, you know, Herf argues this is a mistaken view and he's quite upset about it. I'm seeing it to the extent I do write about the United States through a lens of pragmatism. Uh, it seems to me that if I were a State Department official in 1947, I would see support for a beleaguered and widely hated Jewish state in the midst of the Arab Middle East to be uh, hostile to the West's longstanding best interests. And there's an alternate point of view, completely 180 degrees opposite of this period, in American policy, written by Irene Gensier. Who? Irene Gensier at Columbia University, who demonstrated in an important monograph the pragmatic as opposed to ideological reasoning behind opposition to Israel's creation. For example, she shows that as soon as Israel had proved its mettle in the first several weeks of fighting, or the first month of fighting from mid May to mid June of 1948, a number of senior um, officials in the American government changed their tune with members of the Joint Chiefs of Staff praising Israel now as, quote, second only to Turkey in military capacity in the region. And now, all of a sudden, officials were underplaying Israel's possible pro-Soviet sympathies and now claiming Israel could be a model of economic development for the region. As one um, oil company uh, official wrote, uh, Israel will raise the standard of living of the Arab world, and as the standard of living rises, people consume more oil. So what we have then in the current historiography, on America at least, is monographs that are two sides of the same coin, Herf and Gensier. Both authors exhaustively chronicling State Department opposition to partition in favor of UN trusteeship. The difference between them is that one author, Jeffrey Herf, is outraged by his subject's views. Gensier is outraged that those views were ignored because they have very strong political uh, parti pris, very strong uh, uh, magamot. I believe in this regard I can offer a useful corrective and I want to just give one example before going any further. So it's true, as is well known from Herf's book and others, liberals and social democrats in the United States and Western Europe championed Israel 
as embodying the values of American frontier democracy and European moderate socialism. True. But it doesn't go far enough. Because the liberals who favored Israel's creation had so little sympathy for the Palestinians and Arab world that they marginalized any Palestinian claim to, state, claim to statehood, even after the partition vote and the formation of, at least on paper, the idea of a Palestinian state. So the nation, the liberal, at that time liberal, now more far left, American Journal of Opinion produced a pamphlet which bears the influence of the ed uh, journal's um, editor, the strongly Zionist, uh, Frida Kirchway. The pamphlet claims Arabs have no claim on Palestine because it had never been an Arab state and there was no allied pledge that it would become an Arab state. And by this logic, a lot of parts of the globe colonized by Western powers would have no claim on statehood. But the, the pamphlet claimed even if it had been a state, it wouldn't matter because all Arab states, the pamphlet writes, were creations of the allies who deserved Arab gratitude for, quote, lifting up the submerged Arab world to the dignity of nationhood. Statehood was depicted as a reward for service rendered to the allies in the last war. Whereas Jews throughout the world had fought for the allies in World War II, Mohammed Amin al-Husseini, quote, was a full partner in stimulating the Nazis to carry out the program of extermination of the Jews of Europe. So, you know, one Palestinian leader is resp partly responsible for the Holocaust, which is itself a bit controversial, but also uh, this then disqualifies the claims of the Palestinian people, all 1.2, 1.3 million of them. Um, this is actually a very common view, and this pamphlet was not marginal. It was actually written to be distributed to uh, the United Nations uh, Secretariat and to the members of UNSCOP and so forth. This was like an official statement. Um, obviously, I see here fascinating contradictions within the concepts of liberalism at the time. For the post-war liberals, collective liberty was not a right, but a privilege earned through adherence to certain economics and social benchmarks that were easily recognizable to a mid-20th century American, such as women's suffrage, industrial development, rising wages, and a strong trade union movement that authorized in collective bargaining. So with the nation, they say, you know, if, if there's an Arab state that has any of these qualities or has, you know, it's better than others, and since the Jewish community in Palestine has all of them, therefore it deserves statehood. Um, the Arab world, according to this worldview, was economically and socially backward. Palestinians didn't deserve a state, according to this argument. Moreover, though, the Arab world would not be capable of launching a war against a nascent Jewish state. This was a very powerful American argument made at the time. Um, and it seems to contradict State Department views that opposed Israel's creation, although they had a lot in common. Both perspectives assumed the primacy of Western interests, although they defined the interests in different ways. And each view, that of the State Department and that of the liberals, essentialized the Arab world as fanatical and backward. The pragmatists fretted that the primitives would launch a vengeful jihad, but the liberals confidently predicted that the Arabs would sullenly slink back to their feudal caves. Each cited their particular interpretation of Western interests to underplay the rights of self-determination of one of the claimants on Palestine. Um, so that's like a pretty well-known story, is the American story, so I'm talking about how I'm going to read it a little differently. But what I want to focus on are three aspects of the period that I think have been much less studied. Uh, one from the period February to November of 1947, so the negotiations and of the Palestine question. And then during the war itself, so from late 47 to the spring of 49, and then the immediate aftermath of the war. And in each of them, I want to talk about something that is a little different uh, than what the existing historiography has done. So let's start with the diplomatic struggle for Palestine, 1947. Well, what happens if we don't look at the story from the perspective of Palestine at all, but we look at it from the perspective of the UN, and not UNSCOP itself, but the UN as a whole? We see an organization immersed in a series of crises, all of which were classified at the time, if you look at contemporary United Nations literature, as questions. The Greek question, the Indonesian question, the Palestine question. When you look at UN official publications at the time, that's how, it, that's how it's arranged. Now, Holly Case, who's a wonderful historian at, at Brown, wrote a brilliant book a few years ago called The Age of Questions. When, when you even use that term, question, in a political sense, 
you're reducing a complex, multi-causal and destabilizing phenomenon to a soluble and rational solution. And this goes back to the 19th century. The social question, the Irish question, the women's question, the Jewish question, and for mid-20th century America, the Negro question. That's what it was called. Okay. In United Nations literature, again, we had the Greek question, the Indonesian question, and so forth. And yet, and yet, when the United Nations Special Committee on Palestine went to work, its terms of reference referred to Palestine as, quote, the most momentous international question dividing the world. So the UN's doing a lot of things at the time. So what's going on here? So let's just dig in a little deeper to what the UN is doing in 1946, 47 or so. The Palestine question was preceded by the Greek question. It referred to civil strife within Greece and guerrilla warfare against the Greek regime by Yugoslavia, Bulgaria, and Albania. That began in 1946. But the UN had a problem. It's not supposed to intervene in domestic affairs. They create a special committee, the United Nations Special Committee on the Balkans. What does it do? It focuses on border violations. But it can do nothing when Greek guerrillas declare a provisional government in 1947. So how was the crisis resolved? <clears throat> the UN did nothing. What resolved the crisis was Stalin. When Tito and Stalin broke in 1949, Yugoslavia lost its taste for adventure, and eventually its support for the rebels ebbed, and the civil war sputtered out. In other words, there was very little the UN could do in this situation. Also in this conflict, the US and the USSR were on opposing sides, which highlights another challenge for the UN. Its purview was limited to disputes in which the great powers, that is the five permanent members of the Security Council, weren't parties. The idea is that the UN, like the League of Nations, will help, you know, Portugal and, I don't know, um, Argentina, you know, they'll deal with small states, but they're not going to deal with the great powers. The problem is after World War II, pretty much any geopolitical dispute could be of direct interest to one or two of one or more of the great powers. So in Palestine, the UN could only act because Britain had voluntarily thrown the fate of the country into its lap. And the United States, the Soviet Union, and the United Kingdom, all for different reasons, were interested in dealing with the project by keeping away from the committees and commissions designed to deal with the Palestine question. The issue of purview and power also characterized the so-called Indonesian question, 1947 to 49. The Netherlands said the UN had no right to interfere in its occupation of Indonesia, saying they're a colony, and a colony is essentially a part of the country, and so you have no right to intervene. Well, the Security Council here felt a bit more entitled to push, and mainly because Holland was a minor power. I mean, you can push Holland around in a way that you can't push around the Soviet Union. And when Holland mounted its police actions, its invasions of Indonesia, it called them police actions to suggest that it's not a war. It's like today, a special military action in Ukraine, right? So they called it a police action. But it wasn't enough. Uh, the Security Council did prevail upon Holland to take part in negotiations with the Republicans. Uh, not American Republicans, the Dutch, uh, sorry, the Indonesian rebels. And it led to the formation of a United States of Indonesia, which eventually became a unitary republic. Um, so in this case, it seems like the UN was able to get something done. But really, only because global public opinion had turned so solidly against Holland in the wake of the second police action. And here, for once, there was no major conflict of opinion between the East and the West. The Americans and the Russians were on the same side. So how does this apply to Palestine? Well, in Palestine, despite the differences between the American and Soviet approaches, Soviet was much more solidly pro-Zionist. The Americans vacillated, as we all know. At the end of the day, they were both pro-Zionist. Different reasons and in different ways. And British. Sorry? More anti-British. Anti Americans and the British have their tensions, and the Soviets and the British have their tensions. The Palestine question was also quite different, though, from the Greek and Indonesian cases. And this has to do with the nature of post-war global, global governance and not just the specific facts of the Zionist conflict with Palestine, with the Palestinians. The United Nations was not created to engage in state creation. That wasn't really in its purview. I mean, there's two cases, right? Palestine and East Timor in 1999. When the Palestine issue came to the organization in 1947, what could the UN do? 
they worked within the same mechanisms that had characterized its work on other issues, committees and commissions that produced resolutions, voted up or down, preceded by intense lobbying and power, broking, power brokering. It's just not very effective if you're trying to create a state. Now, to be fair, it's highly doubtful that direct negotiations between Jews and Arabs under the UN's auspices could have had any positive outcome. And although UNSCOP, the United Nations Committee on Palestine, has been criticized from many quarters, we have to remember that its makeup at the time was very much representative of the international community. After all, what was the UN at the time? Mostly European, Latin American, former British dominions, and a handful of non-colonized or very recently emerging uh, decolonized African and Asian countries. India and Iran, not friendly to Zionism, were included on the committee and the Indian delegate, the jurist Abdul Rahman, was one of the committee's most outspoken and indeed querulous members. And there's a wonderful book about this that some of you may know, uh, and I forget if it's, been, if it's Yad Ben Sphere, or was it this press that published El, El Ad Ben Dror's book on, Alvarez. yeah, so it's a wonderful book. The only thing that's missing from it is I think some of the human element, because when I read the protocols of the meetings of the committee, it's clear that Abdul Rahman is a really difficult guy. And you can almost see the other committee's members' eyes rolling as he's like pushing and pushing and pushing. And you really need to sort of approach those protocols from the perspective of organizational psychology and read how, you know, how people are clashing with each other and eventually how um, it takes the strom arm tactics of, of Emil Sandstrom to get a kind of a consensus. Um, but, you know, the committee had lots of people who were undecided about Zionism. I mean, the Peruvian delegate, who was also the ambassador to the Vatican, was his concept of what would be a Jewish state was really totally unrealistic. Um, uh, Ivan Rand was, the Canadian, was, I suppose, pro-Zionist, but open to many approaches. In, in other words, I think it was actually something of an open book. And yet, even more than the UNSCOP recommendations, it's the vote itself on partition that's come under the most attack as the product of Western or particularly American machinations. So where does this, this idea come from? Because it's often many, many books on the story, on the conflict will tell you that the UN vote was somehow rigged. Well, where does this come from? Well, the Arab Higher Committee sent a letter to the UN Secretariat on 7 February 1948. It claimed, quote, the partition resolution was null and void because of pressure put by the United States delegation and government on certain nations, Colombia, Cuba, Haiti, Liberia, the Philippines, and so forth. The partition recommendation, according to this letter, does not represent the sentiments of the United Nations. Now, generations of historians have agreed basically with this argument. Not that it didn't represent the UN, but that the US pressured a bunch of countries. When you look at a book on this, it refers you to another book. The book refers you to another book, the book. Where does it all go back to? It goes back to a memorandum by George Cannon on 19 January 1948, a long memorandum. Did George Cannon ever write a memorandum that wasn't long? <laughs> it details the accusations. When reading the document, two problems leap to mind. First, the Arab League itself was also lobbying and pressuring UN delegations regarding the vote. Second, two states that came in for an American full court press, Cuba and Greece, refused to change their minds. The fact is, bargaining and threatening were and have remained an essential part of the process by which the UN's voting blocs are formed. And even more important, I think Kennan's evidence is incomplete. And I'm going to cite just one example from archival research that I've done. And there'll, there'll be more, but I'm just giving you an example of the kind of thing I'm trying to do. At the beginning of the memo, Kennan claims, based on third-hand reports, that, quote, our Chinese friends were told that if they did not vote for partition, they would not receive a penny of United States aid. Now, that struck me as a little odd. This is a time when the United States is in, uh, showering money upon the Republic of China in its civil war with the communists. Secretary of State George Marshall has just been to China to plead personally with Chiang Kai-shek to reduce human rights abuses in nationalist China, and he's been essentially rebuffed. It's really unlikely that the American government would reduce aid to nationalist China because of Palestine. But also, archival sources from the Republic of China actually 
give you information on how China was, show, was forming its Palestine policy at the time. I mean, there's nothing new about the new diplomatic history, but the new diplomatic history means that if you want to understand U.S.-China relations, you look at Chinese archives. You want to understand Indonesia, you look at Indonesian archives. You don't just go to Washington. And so it's difficult because you have to go to archives all over the world, but let's see what comes up with. So you look at the nationalist Chinese archives from Taipei. What do you see? You see nationalist China trying on the one hand to maintain good relations with Arab states. There is also an awareness of and sympathy for Zionism, dating back to Sun Yat-sen's personal support that had been maintained by his widow Su, uh, Sun Qingling. Moreover, during the Second World War, the nationalists had seriously considered creating a Jewish refuge in Yunnan province. Now, the plan was scuppered, mainly because we think of Japanese and German uh, opposition, but there was a combination of awareness and sympathy and no small belief in the utilitarian value of Jews as allies on the world stage. Now, if you look at the correspondence from November of 1949, we see several senior Chinese diplomats acknowledging American lobbying on Palestine. These people included Xiang Tingfu, the Chinese ambassador to the UN, Qiu Lai, member of the Chinese delegation to the UN, and Ku Vi Quyen, also known, better known as Wellington Ku, a Princeton-educated gentleman, revered figure in Chinese politics, former prime minister, and at this time, China's ambassador to the United States. On 29 November, Lai cobbled Nanjing that American senators were pressuring China to vote for partition. What does he write? Haiti and the Philippines had claimed they will oppose partition, but American pressure is forcing them to vote in favor instead. So that's nice evidence about Haiti and the Philippines. A few days earlier, the former Treasury Secretary, former Treasury Secretary, Henry Morgenthau, had told Ku that, quote, for the future of China-U.S. cooperation, he expected China to support partition. But the only specific threat to cut off aid, according to Wellington Ku, came from, quote, important figures from the Jewish side. So what do we see from this? Any threats to China regarding its partition vote were indirect or unofficial. It came from a former Treasury Secretary. It came from a Jewish delegation. Now, were the Chinese naive enough to believe that the Jewish, or whoever these people were, that they somehow spoke for the U.S. government? I don't know. I hardly think so. Wellington Koo was a smart man, and the ambassador to the, um, the Chinese ambassador to the United Nations, Xiang Tingfu, had, first of all, he was a student of American foreign policy. Uh, by the way, he kept a meticulous diary in English so that his wife wouldn't understand it, and it's, it's been deposited in the Yenching Library at Harvard, so you can imagine the fun I'm having with this. Um, so what do we get, get for this? I mean, China followed its own preferred course of action, which was to abstain. Doing so disappointed Jewish groups. It infuriated Egypt, but China went its own course, as did Greece and Cuba. So what's my argument? National interest, rather than ideology, per se, or humanitarianism alone, or antipathy, shaped, at least in this case, diplomatic responses to the Palestine question. So, you know, I'm going to look at other countries, but I'm just giving an example. Now, once the war broke out, the Palestine issue moved from a matter of elite diplomacy to one of global concern, and was covered by the press worldwide. Now, I believe the culture, the, the, the press coverage was also reflective of national interests. And I'm not going to ignore high diplomacy in the second part of the book, but I'm going to bring in, it's like bringing in the orchestra, bringing in the strings or something, or the brass or the windwinds, and I'm going to start focusing a lot on media coverage. What interests me is what was and was not covered. Sometimes silence is more interesting than speech. Now, in North America and the United Kingdom, Jerusalem was a focal point of attention, which makes sense. I mean, Christian sentiments uh, uh, matter here. So battles within the old city figured very prominently. There was, and the UK, and the UK. I'm going to get there. Okay, okay. There was a marked decline of interest in Palestine after the signing of the first truce and reportage on the fighting in the second half of 1948 often lacked color and urgency. The one exception was the mission of Volker Bernadotte and his assassination. Major newspapers devoted entire stories to the mass killings at Deir Yassin in April, but made no reference to any other occurrences of killings by Jewish forces during the war. 
And I want to focus on one case. Again, I've only had time to do these sondages. So I was in Munich last semester teaching, and I reviewed the German press for the period of the war. Now, before undertaking the study, I'd been in touch with a learned German professor of post-war German history, and I asked him about German reactions to the establishment of Israel, and he said, oh, nobody noticed. Uh, okay, well, fine, you know, l let me check. <laughs> Judging by the German press, nothing could be further from the truth. Between the partition vote and the first truce, Palestine was on the front page of the major German newspapers on a regular basis, often daily, for some periods for weeks at a time. Now, keep in mind, on the one hand, the stories came from wire services. There's an exception I'll get to in a second. But their prominence was revealing them day after day, front page, front page, front page. Now, what was a German newspaper in 1948? Six to eight pages long with maybe one page of foreign news. So anything happening in Palestine had to compete with China, India, the Marshall Plan, Cold War in Europe, currency reform, and from June of 1948, the Berlin blockade. They had things on their mind. So even if the reporting is neutral, it, it, there's something going on here. And yes, much of it concerned Jerusalem and reflected a Christian perspective. Now there is some exception here. The left-wing Berliner Zeitung, which had been always leftist, went full-throttle communist in 1948, and in a way it's kind of boring because it was just relentlessly pro-Zionist. Um, the Berlin Tagesspiegel was much more neutral, and I think that's because its founders were kind of liberals who had spent the war in inner emigration, but they, I think, there's a lot going on in that they wanted to cover it so deeply, um, and yet they didn't really want to make any specific comments about it. The most interesting case, though, the most explicit, is the Hamburg-based weekly Die Zeit, based in Hamburg. Okay. So Die Zeit had abundant commentary on the war by Marian Donhoff, and if I were in Germany, everybody's eyes would roll. Marian Donhoff was a towering figure in German journalism. She started off on the Palestine beat in 48. She wound up becoming the newspaper's <laughs> chief editor and co-publisher. She was from an old East Prussian noble family, had opposed the Nazis, but was not a Republican, and certainly not free of anti-Semitism. In her post-war journalistic writings about national socialism, not surprisingly, I mean, she never mentioned the Holocaust. The Holocaust was barely mentioned in Germany at the time. Um, when she wrote for the paper from 1948, she wrote of, quote, the need to articulate a German national interest despite all the misfortune that Hitler brought upon the Germans. And that was his fault. For Dornhoff, Israel was a problem. She explicitly compared the Yagun and Lehi to Nazis. Other people in Israel did that. But she also called Israel a, quote, Völkische Ordenstadt, so a kind of a folkish state, and a Völkisch homogenen Stadt. By the way, she also called the revival of the Hebrew language a frantic effort. She just dismissed the whole thing as useless. She unfavorably compared Jerusalem's 2,000-year-old association with Christian peace and reconciliation with the, quote, unwavering will, determination, and aggression of the young Israeli state. On Israel and other issues, Donhoff's views dovetailed with those of the foreign affairs editor, known by the name of Ernst Krüger, but who was in fact a Nazi diplomat, an SS officer named Erwin Etel. When he was outed, he simply retired at full pension, and that was the end of him. So what we have here is then plentiful war coverage, ambivalent attitudes towards the new state of Israel, and silence regarding the Holocaust. We see all of these features in the very popular news magazine, Der Spiegel. Now, the magazine was founded by a man who'd been a conscript during the war. He was never a Nazi, a member of the Nazi party. He must have been aware of and approve of the high level of coverage of the war. Okay, in 1948, Israel got substantive coverage in 29 issues. China for 20, 20 for China, 12 for Greece, 7 for India, and 5 for Indonesia. So something's going on here. Much of the coverage was pro-Zionist, with David Ben-Gurion hailed as a hero, Mohammed Amin al-Husseini condemned as a Nazi collaborator, and the United States and the United Nations criticized for backing away from partition in the winter of 1948. The magazine featured several front uh, cover page photographs of Israeli fighters, and it sympathetically documented the travails of displaced persons striving to get to Israel. They also female fighters, 
you know, the exoticization of the Israeli female soldiers already. You see this in 48. However, there's also a good deal of anti-Semitism. Uh, for example, stories about the DPs. The magazine wrote about um, female passengers on the SS Exodus who had finally arrived in the Jewish state. Quote, many of the women today wear gold rings, are manicured, made up, and banknotes pile up in their husband's briefcases. Tel Aviv was described as containing, quote, the concentrated financial power of world Jewry. Yeah, if only, right? Um, not much attention to the DPs, but not a word about the circumstances that had led the DPs to be there in the first place. It's like they were mushrooms that just arose after the rain. It juxtaposed Christianity as a religion of peace versus the allegedly fanatical, hateful, and enraged behavior of the Jews on the SS Exodus. So there's plenty of anti-Semitism here. Now this is a very unusual case, you could argue. It certainly has exceptional features. Um, I've begun looking at the Latin American press, uh, which is of course, for the most part, very favorable, but you never quite know why. So just a couple of days ago, I found in the Zionist archive, I think I'm the first person to work through the Z5 files on the Latin American federations, maybe someone here has, um, where, what's his name? I'm, I'm blind, having a senior moment. The Lithuanian Jew who emigrated to the United States and founded the United Fruit Company. Ziggurai, Ziggurai, yeah, Ziggurai, something like that. So there's a letter saying that, um, it's, this is in Honduras, that says that, you know, Ziggurai had a word with the local newspaper, the, the national newspaper published out of Tegucigalpa, and that from now on, all stories about the war will be uh, taken directly from the Jewish Telegraph Agency. You know, so there's some influence there. But this is what I'm beginning to dig into. Um, so what I'm just saying is that, again, I think that you need to look at press coverage country by country. I can't do every country in the world, but I'll do as much as I can. But that tells you what's happening in real time. What about after the war? So the third part of the book deals with the crafting of narratives in a way during the war and in the couple of years after. And we see something really interesting, which is on the one hand, the narratives are formed that are very familiar in following decades, but there's these weird differences. It's as if there's a certain complexity um, to narratives formed in 48, 950 that gets dropped out along the way. Just start in the Arab world, the most famous work being Constantine Zarek's Mana'a Nakba, The Meaning of Catastrophe from 1948. Now, much of his argument is well known to anyone who has studied uh, any kind of writing in the Arab world about Palestine in the decades before he wrote this. The Arab claim on Palestine represents the expression of natural right. The Jews are a religious community, not a nation. The only just solution is for Palestine to become a unitary democratic state, in which he writes, the Jews will dispose of all rights to which their numbers entitle them. But then there's some new stuff. Now the author is a Syrian of Greek Orthodox background who emphasizes that what really matters about the war was its demonstration of the disunity and backwardness and weakness of the Arab world as opposed to the towering strength of the Zionist enemy. A zealous pan-Arabist, Zaraic saw Israel as the greatest threat to the creation of a vibrant and healthy united Arab polity. And he worried that if a Jewish state were created, quote, the Zionist danger will gradually permeate our sickly, worn body with a cancerous taint, and one day, lo, all of Palestine will be in the hands of the energetic and militant minority. And as he also said in a radio broadcast just a couple of months before publishing the book, the facility that the Zionist forces have for growth and expansion will place the Arab world forever at their mercy if the Arab world is permitted to exist at all. We struggle simply to defend ourselves against treacherous aggression. I think here we're setting a tone for much of the Arab world's reaction after the war, a deep-seated existential fear of Israel, alongside of a call for educational reform, technological innovation, and the creation of new merit-based elites. Zaraic's work, like so much writing in the Arab world after the war, was steeped in anti-Semitism. Zaraic accused Jews of possessing worldwide power and controlling entire industries in the United States. Yeah. 
Um, I'm going to need a little more time. I'm sorry. Well, because it's already, we only have till, we have till two, right? Yeah, we'll till two. Okay. Wanna, yeah, that's fine. I'm just okay, I'll make it as quick as I can. I mean, no, I, no, it's, a, it's a 50 we minute can, we can talk. Leave, like, yeah. 30 minutes for Yeah, that's why I thought, I thought that's, that's what, fine. Yeah, that's okay. what I usually do. That's why the paper's as long as it is. I mean, I time it. Okay. Um, so, um, so, okay, fine. Uh, that's, you know, we've heard this, we will have heard this many times. What about the Palestinians? They barely feature. They, they, they barely appear in, in the work, um, very briefly. Now then, just a few months after the book came out, Musa Alami, the Palestinian politician, wrote an article in which he combined Zuraic's arguments with references to the plight of the refugees. And yet Alami's narrative is not what my, one might expect. He makes no reference to refugee return, which is a fundamental demand at the Lausanne Peace Conference in 1949. He attacks Arab countries for not allowing refugees' rights and the ability to work. He claims that Palestinians had fled their homes out of a lack of confidence in their capacity for defense, makes no reference to expulsion. And he claims that Palestinians were told that Arab armies were coming, that the matter would be settled and everything returned to normal. And again, this is a, sounds like almost something out of a pro-Zionist narrative, that Arabs fled voluntarily and they weren't expelled and so forth. So it's a very odd kind of narrative, a lot of which dropped out in Arab writing after the war. One thing, though, on which Alami uh, and I think any narrative of the war, but even a, most pro-Zionist narratives could agree, was, quote, the specter of Deir Yassin with all of its brutality. And the final section here, I want to look at three books written after the war in, in English. Deir Yassin figures in all of them. And I think they, they provide a kind of a narrative of the war that is in some ways extremely predictive of the way that, at least in the English-speaking world, people would perceive the war for decades to come. But in some ways, they're different. So let's take Kessler's Promise and Fulfillment, for example. Um, and then I'm going to also talk about Kenneth Bilby, a much less known figure, the New York Herald Tribune's uh, um, correspondent in Palestine, brilliant journalist, wrote a fantastic book right after the war called New Star in the East. He's a first-rate journalist. And then the third one is called Cairo to Damascus uh, from 1951 by Arthur Darunian. He was an American of uh, Armenian origin, Armenian origin, who wrote under the pen name um, John Roy Carlson. He infiltrated neo-Nazi, not neo, sorry, Nazi groups in the States during the 1930s and wrote a book about it that was a bestseller. So his book, um, uh, then, then he wrote From Cairo to Jerusalem, which also sold very well. All of the books sold well. All of the books got good reviews in major newspapers, so these, these books have resonance that I'm going to talk about. The only negative review I think one of them got was um, Kermit Roosevelt, Jr., the anti-Zionist intelligence officer, didn't like um, Darunian's book. And the only reason I mention this is that my granddaughter is thrilled that I'm writing a book in which a character is named Kermit. <laughs> so I just have to mention it. The narratives, at least two of them, are very complex they're supportive of Zionism, but much more, I'd say, open to Israel's flaws than uh, you find later. So, for example, Kessler. The bloodbath at Deir Yassin, he writes, was an isolated episode in the war between Arabs and Jews. It owes its notoriety to the fact that it was an exception, and at least the Jews committed no acts of sadism. And he compares this favorably with the photographs he was shown of Jewish bodies that were mutilated by Arab, um, Arab fighters. He then drives the point home. The fact is, one should not romanticize the gentle savage. He accuses um, them of, quote, infantile sadism. This is his writing, not mine. Kessler accepted the position of the Jewish agency that the attack was the work of, quote, Jewish terrorists, that is, the Irgun and Lehi. But he disagrees with the Sochnut in that he praises the Irgun, um, that this was a, the one exception to their policy of avoiding indiscriminate murder. He's actually very sympathetic to the Irgun, as some of you might know. He was um, quite critical of the Israeli government's approach to the Alta Lean affair and so forth. So that's a little different from standard government line. He chronicled Palestinian flight in, d in detail. There's no detail missing, really, except he chronicles it as piteous, but not tragic. He writes the 70,000 Arabs of Haifa fled without a serious fight for the simple reason that they had nothing to fight for. They had accepted the presence of the Jews long ago. And on a local level, they got along quite well with them. They were an easygoing, peace-loving, and individualistic people with narrow interests and no national consciousness. So it's the way you talk about something, but then kind of redirect. He was critical, though, 
of Israeli forces. He called them brutish, impulsive, and vulgar, and yet he also praised Israeli energy, capacity for impro improvisation, and in the end he said this is a just war if any war can be just. If anything, Bilby's book is even more interesting. Um, he's a Protestant. He's got no bone in the fight, no dog in the fight. He describes the killings of Darya, at Darya Sin as, quote, an act of savagery which brought forth a shocked denunciation from the Jewish agency. But moreover, he was actually on the scene at Lida and Ramla in July. He was there on the scene. And this is what he writes. It's really interesting. At dusk one evening, an Israeli jeep column took off from the Lida airport and raced into Lida with rifles, stens, and submachine guns blazing. It coursed through the main streets, blasting at everything that moved. The town toppled in panic. I went into Lida the following day. Corpses of Arab men, women, even children, were strewn in the streets in the wake of this ruthlessly brilliant charge. Civilians who had been trapped by the Jewish encirclement cowered behind shuttered windows. White flags were draped from every home. In adjacent Ramallah, 4,000 to 5,000 Arab men of fighting age fell into Israeli hands, as well as another 40,000 civilians who were given the right to leave their homes and move to Arab territory. It's a fascinating way of describing what happened. They're given the right to leave their homes and move to Arab territory. So there's a sanitizing of what happened in Lida and Ramla, and, and yet he could be very critical. He, as many of you know that Israel basically formed a pretext in October to initiate Operation Hiram. Um, Bilby condemned this as Machiavellian. He called Israel's decision to close its borders to refugees and to confiscate their property as, quote, morally dubious. The refugees, he said, are a vast pool of human misery, and some form of refugee return, he wrote, would be essential if Israel and the Arab world were ever to make peace. And without that peace, he said, the Arab states could prove, could turn pro-Soviet, and that could damage American oil interests in the Middle East, and everything is tied up with the Cold War and with oil. Bilby rejected Israeli claims that the refugees could be a fifth column. And he says, with great uh, perceptiveness, he writes, everyone was grasping at straws of justification. Opposition to Arab return was soon welded into an amorphous hole. He wrote that Israelis were forming a destructive guilt complex and that, that their villages had been, quote, raised to the ground but remained in the background ghost-like. So he's, he's, he's aware of something. And he writes that if it, in the future Israel were ever to conquer the West Bank, Muslim unity, I'm quoting him, would be enhanced as with the concept of Israel as a crusader state. He was critical of what he called Zionism's messianic overtones, and what he called the emotionalism of redemption. So he was not uncritical. And yet in the end, in the end, his sympathies are with the Jews. He admired their intelligence, their devotion, again, their capacity for improvisation. And as he wrote at the beginning of the book, Israel's Jews were subjecting Palestine to a vast project of what he called facelifting. Developments on a scale and with an intensity that the Holy Land has not known in 50 centuries of recorded history. He starts the book in the abandoned village of Sasa, where American-born kibbutzniks are using American tools and tractors to build a modern Western community. Sasa, quote, which has existed unchanged for a thousand years, is an offering like the lambs of Abraham for the betterment of the people of Israel. In the Negev, prefabricated dwellings of Swedish origin nestle among, quote, the black tents of Bedouin tribesmen. I'm quoting him, okay? I'm not those debilitated Arab nomads so strikingly akin to the American Indian. In the heart of Tel Aviv, I'm quoting, he saw the beginning of an Israeli version of New York City's Rockefeller Center. Ad kach. Okay, so it's a mix, right? So it's a fascinating book, and I think he's a fascinating guy. I want to learn more about him. He was, I, fine. And then I'm just going to finish briefly with references to Carlson, because it's a different kind of narrative. Now, Carlson went to Egypt in 1948, gained the trust of Egyptian volunteer fighters, and then accompanied them to Jerusalem. He witnessed the fight for and the fall of the Jewish quarter of the old city. And after months of colorful adventures, he returned to America and wrote from Cairo to Damascus. Now in this book, like in his previous one, he tracked down Nazis and Nazi sympathizers. He narrates numerous encounters with German officers fighting for the Arabs and Arabs expressing pro-Nazi views. 
Arabs, he writes, like Nazis, are associated with decadence, disease, and sexual depravity, as Carlson makes clear in a lurid description of belly dancers performing for SS officers in a Damascus nightclub. In contrast, he writes on the kibbutzim in Israel, quote, murder, uh, sexual aberrations, and robbery are unheard of. In Israel, divorces are rare. He wrote that in Israel, there are no problems with illicit drug use, gambling, alcoholism, or prostitution. He never read Bialik. He writes, quote, had not the Bible, the Talmud, and Christ himself preached this simple and humble life. Carlson was possessed of a post-millenarian Christian outlook, a philosemitism common in his day and quite distant from the evangelical premillennialism pre so prevalent in our time. For him, the second coming of Christ lay in the distant future and only after a thousand year period of peace and social justice, which must be the work of human agency. And so his writings about Israel's creation weave together liberalism, praise for human freedom, and Christian faith. He writes, quote, here in the ancient homeland, the fighting, colonizing, and civilizing instincts blossom in full. The Jews of Jerusalem have emerged into the greatness inherent in every man, every Arab, every felach, everyone conceived in his image. So he's including the Arabs in a vision of human freedom in, in, right, because of his, his Christianity. Um, just to sum it up, as he writes, uh, in the simplest of terms, is Israel as I saw it represented good, the Arab world represented evil. So, okay, you know where he stands. Um, and by the way, this antipathy led to his account of the refugees. He claimed that their numbers were grossly exaggerated and, quote, they were mostly homeless nomadic wanderers in the first place. Now, he does castigate Jewish forces at Deir Yassin, but basically it's a product of Arab mendacity and an exceptional outburst of murderous <laughs> rage. So what was his Zitzim Leben? A Christian, an Armenian? As he writes, in my mind's eye, I found myself substituting Armenian for Hebrew characters in the alphabet. I saw an Armenian democracy. I read Armenian newspapers. I saw Armenians at work consumed with the energy of a liberated people. I saw Armenia being rebuilt, and yea, I dreamed. Now, I see this book, not despite its moral recklessness, I see this book as actually more representative of later, like the Leon Uris narrative of 1958, Exodus and then the movie 1960. This is actually looks forward a bit in that it's a much less complicated narrative uh, than Kessler or Bilby. So I'm interested in these post-war narratives and then you know carry it up into maybe the 1970s when the whole notion of Nakba really crystallizes with the rise of the Palestinian <coughs> issue to the forefront of the international community. It's not really there in 48, but it's certainly there 20-ish years later. So one paragraph conclusion. So I've sketched out a few points, just a few points which over the next months or even years, I hope to link together into a curve, into a book about a small local war fought in fits and starts over a period of little more than a year, but a war that had global dimensions and whose consequences have been as widespread as they've been enduring. As Kessler wrote, from a distance the war was a cinematic fantasy, the sons of the, of the desert in a holy war against resurrected Maccabeans. But close up, it was a phony war, he writes, of small and hopelessly inefficient bands of Levantine mercenaries scrimmaging against improvised Jewish home guard units with a great amount of bragging and bombast on both sides. I hope my book can illuminate the contrast between the scale, the actual scale of the events in Palestine and their global resonance, which again, to finish with Kessler, underlies the general ambiguity of all historic episodes in their transition from the trivial familiarity of the present to the heroic perspective of the past. So thank you for your patience. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Professor, thank you for your insightful talk. Uh, really brought into focus so many global developments and perspectives that we usually lose sight of uh, when thinking about Israel's early history. So thank you so much for this. Thank you, I look forward to your, yeah, your so comments, please. So we're going to gather three questions in the time, uh, as we usually do. Uh, Nathan is going to be the first one, the first round. Then Arya and Paul, you're the last one. Thank you uh, very much. Um, it's always room. It's so much more room um, to 
approach, and it's fascinating, your thoughts. I just wanted to add very, very briefly comments and then a question. When you mentioned the war, um, in Israel, we understand the war began on the 30th of November. Mm -hmm. There's a civil war going on right. for six months. Right. Whereas, when in the historiography, it's considered only starting when the Arab army is invading Israel. Mm -hmm. And the other thing is, the great hero of the situation for Israel, Oswaldo Arana from Brazil. Mm -hmm. And there's a great book by, by, about him by Jeffrey Lesser about postponing the UN vote. Right. The Jewish agency bugged the room, so I had to transport all the Arab delegations and how they were voting. On the Philippines, by the way, the US did bribe them because mm -hmm. they, had a, they had appealed for a loan mm -hmm. and hadn't got it and right. given it at the last minute. The other interesting contribution, which isn't mentioned here, you noted 58 states. Right. There are only 57 voted. Right. right? Siam, yeah. there was a coup d'etat right. on the 8th of November, and right. the UN, the US managed to discredit their credentials. Right. Um, interesting, like Kessler. Kessler was a revisionist. He worked with Jabotinsky, and yep. he was very interested about the information uh, that he received. The last thing I wanted to ask you um, is that when you say there are sources in China mm -hmm. or other places, to what extent are they open to researchers? I mean, is it just based on the diary? Because I've gone through every single country how they voted. Right. Um, Cuba's archive has just been open. Right. Um, but thank you. And what do you think of my question? <laughs> um, can we take two more questions and then we'll Yeah, I'll just try to get, remember it all. It's going to be the problem because that's, that's a great question. It's complicated and hard to remember. Can I answer so, just really quickly? Yeah, yeah. Um, terrific th uh, things. Um, okay, so about the archives, because I know, I know of your work and how meticulous it's been. I don't know if anyone's, look, the, the Chinese nationalist archives are online. Uh, I mean, you have to read Chinese, which I, I, I there's my assistant, Sheng Zhang, who I give him full credit for. A lot of the material, there is material in English and French and all kinds of languages in the Chinese archives. But he definitely, you know, he's, he burrowed his way in there and found the files from the second half of 1947. And I, you know, we've gone through them together. And um, just to make sure, I've also had every thing that he has pointed out to me, I've had it then checked by a, a second source to make sure that the translation's accurate, because I'm not used to working with languages that I don't know myself. That's something that journalists do, but scholars aren't supposed to do. Um, so I think you're right. And yes, you're absolutely right, of course, about Siam. And about the war, uh, I want to make clear that when, like for example, the world press is covering the war, um, you're right, it doesn't start in mid-November, it starts on the, with the partition, yeah, and, you, and then it's constant. I mean, that's the thing, the German coverage, for example, December, January, February, it's constant. Okay, so that's, that, but, you know, the, the, the fine point of a couple of weeks is a little different, and thanks for the reference to, um, to Arano, that's actually really important. Okay. working on this and, and some of the substantive issues as well. So first of all, you, you touched on this in your final comment, right? The sort of uh, the curve that you're talking about. And it's uh, maybe too early to ask this, but um, can you say something about how you see the different pieces coming together? Right? You, you said something about not being able to look at every country in the world, which in fact I imagine is the case, but uh, how do you take all of this and, and transform it from you know, various vignettes uh, into a book that coheres. Yeah. Um, what, what, what are the what are the themes or the pieces that bring the that bring this together? Right? Related to that, um, uh, I'll ask two other questions, and I'll limit myself to, to those two. Um, in a way, you're looking at really narrative. This is the focus of the book, right? Narratives and sort of images of the war. To what extent are you? Can, Creating some kind of a dialogue with with um, sort of the empirical data, right? The sort of military histories and, and, the, and the political histories and diplomatic histories. I mean, we've heard some of it, some maybe, but uh, I'd like to get into a little bit more. And then the last question, um, which also you touched on a little bit, if you can say something about, you know, again, maybe too early, causal factors in shaping the different elements, right? You touched a little bit on sort of religious dimensions. 
uh, oil interests, right? But I wonder to what extent you see those as really, in a sense, as, as causal in helping to shape some of these narratives, mm -hmm. or you know, what what kind of role would they play? Yeah, maybe. Uh, I think okay. so. Is that okay? Can, can I start? Okay. Yeah. Thanks. This, that was really fascinating, and um, so what I see, in fact. It's not diplomatic history because it's the international perspective on what's happening in Palestine. And, and what I see here is various levels of that international perspective. Mm -hmm. So there are the journalists, right? Um, I have to say, I, I bumped into Damascus to Jerusalem. Yeah, Arabic. it's a fun book. It's an amazing book because he tells the story. He started, he was supposed to be on the Palestinian side. Right. That's what he thought he would be. So. That kind of accounts of people who, in a way, are, I would say, innocent uh, mm -hmm. observers. They surprise, the reality surprises them, and they share that surprise, that astonishment, and the, they share their audience and what is going on with mm -hmm. them. So that's one level. And then there's the level of, I would say, the middle, the middle, um, uh, the mid, the mid diplom diplomats, right? The, the, the non, the less important members of of United Nations. Right? Let's say the people who are diplomats, but not, not in the in the State Department, not the powers. Right. You know, Granados, I guess, is one of yeah. A, a, someone who was on the scene, in in duty, but didn't necessarily represent the power. And then, of course, you have the diplomats. So the, one question is, are they all one? I guess they're not, but I, I just I just wonder how how you make sense into this in this international observation because I I love it that all are all exist. I just wonder how you're how you're gonna deal with them eventually when you want to say something general about this out this uh, looking at the inside from the outside, looking right. at Israel from the outside. And uh, another question of course interests me is um, who, which one, which level was the one that do you see when you have to define the influence at the end of the day, right. public opinion? Was it Kessler and the Armenian guy that I always forget his name, or yeah, it, was it uh, Granados, or I mean, for his people, or was it, our, is it the, the official diplomats or the official spokesmen, spokespersons for the foreign offices. So I wonder at the end of the day, when we look at how Israel's place in the world is um, resigned and goes through a change, who is it? Which is, which, right. I don't know if you have any idea about the future, just share it. Right? Yeah. Just share it with yeah. us as, as we move. And finally, I will just say that I think the big question that you're raising here is the question that we are, um, that um, is, is on the center of our agenda all the time until this very day, and that is yeah. Pourquoi Pourquoi Israel? Yeah. Yeah. That raises so much interest. Yeah. And I just wonder if you have already, if you can already share with us some of your preliminary conclusions. Right. Yeah. Two questions, and then we'll take around. We'll have a round later. Yeah. So can I answer these? Yeah. Paula and others. Yeah. Um, okay. So how do you meld the three parts together, vignettes into a camera and Harold? Damned if I know. I mean, that's what I'm. <laughs> That's what I'm figuring. That's what I'm figuring out. Um, I have a model in mind. There's a very good book by Paul Chamberlain called um, "The Cold War Is Killing Field." So it's a book like my book's for a trade press, by the way. I mean, I'm, I'm doing it as a trade book, which means um, I have to tell stories. Um, I can never mention the name of another historian. Uh, we talked about this at dinner a couple of nights ago, and no jargon. And the book has to be full of arguments and ideas, and they have to be coded into, right, we talked about this, into the narrative, which means that, no historian. sorry? No, historian mentioned. no, because this is for trade press. My agent made it very clear. You do not, this is not, it's a scholarly book that you could pick up and learn from and you'd want to read, but it's also a book for the lawyers and the physicians and the politicians and the diplomats and the people who actually make a difference in the world, unlike us. Um, no, it's true. Um, but, no, I think that if we, it depends. I mean, my colleagues at Harvard who write for the general public and Barack Obama uh, reads them or whatever, yeah, I think it makes a difference. Um, so, and I can't recommend that to a graduate student who's just starting and you have to engage in these exercises to prove your scholarly capacity. And so you have to do that. 
But at a certain point, I think it's not just a luxury, I think it's an actually an obligation to write for more general audiences. So this is a trade book, which means it does not follow the conventions of an academic monograph. At the same time, it has to be respectable. It's going to have to go through peer review and all of that. It's going to have notes. And I also have to be able to look at myself in the mirror in the morning. So um, what I liked about Chamberlain's book is that on one level, it's very synthetic. Uh, you know, he didn't go to every archive everywhere because he's covering everything from Korea to, you know, Vietnam, Cambodia, Iran. He's everything, all of Asia, all the wars in Asia from like, what, 45? I'm trying to remember where he stops. If he stops in Iraq or something? I mean, it's vast, the book, 2000. I forget how far the book goes up. Extremely well written, extremely fluid, very learned. Um, and a lot of primary source research in there blended with the synthesis. Um, does the book have a central argument? Well, everything's America's fault, because everything's always America's fault when you teach at Columbia University. Um, I'm hoping my book will have a stronger argument. We'll get to that in a second. And what I'm hoping to do, and this actually combines both of your questions, is deal quite explicitly with the different levels. That there's, and there's even more levels than that. I mean, there's the level of the chief policymakers. There's the level of sort of the international diplomats and so forth who actually probably don't get their word out to the public opinion. Then there's the world of the disseminators, the, 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 the journalists, the, you know, and so forth. But there's another level, which I already wrote about in a, another article, which is the kind of more, um, uh, the petty bourgeois of journalists, the one, uh, ones who wrote for like lo local Jewish newspapers, uh, rabbinical sermons, uh, Protestant uh, preachers, I mean, uh, summer camp, uh, brochures from summer camps, I mean, everything, right? And that, that level is the most fun, but of course, as you go down the pyramid, you get more and more sources, and in, in, and in the Devarsov. So um, I think that's how I will meld the vignettes, is actually by being very explicit about the different levels. And I do want to argue, I mean, every book I write has an arc. In the case of Herzl, it's easy. He's born, he lives, he dies. But, but and my other books all have an arc. And with this one, I think it's going to be, really, the book is about the creation of a narrative. So it's about the, um, the confusion and chaos of the events itself, and then how the war is understood, and how even during the war, and as I said, immediately after, you get then this kind of ex post facto creation of an idea of what the war was. And I think I'll, it might be a whole separate part of the book when I talk about then narrative formation during the 1950s and 60s. This book might wind up being half about the war and half about narrative. I just have no idea yet, because that might be really interesting. Um, so, and then as far as ca causality, um, I think it's pretty clear that ultimately decisions are made by elites, and I mean the highest elites in terms of cause. And this, I'm a very old-fashioned historian. I mean, the presidents and the prime ministers and their senior advisors, I mean, these are the people who make history, ultimately. And I don't, I'm not a big believer in history from below, uh, even though I'm interested in what people think. Ultimately, the people at the top make the big decisions. So that's where I think causality comes from. And then, um, so yes, yeah, da, 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 da. And then why Israel? Yes, um, that is the big question. And it just fascinates me that um, Israel, even before Israel, becomes a global issue. I'm not quite right about, I mean, in India, there's a lot of interest in Palestine already in the 1930s, in the 1920s and 30s, with the Muslim Congresses that the uh, Amin al-Husseini convenes in, in Jerusalem. So already, you know, Muslim Indians are being brought into the picture. But I really think that the UN in 47 it marks another important step forward. And I mean, my two cents, which you've probably heard me say before, you've, I mean, I've written about this, I really think it's not that much or only about Jews. I'm convinced that if the Jews had established a state in Tierra del Fuego, it would be very different. But of all the places in the world, here? <laughs> I don't know if any of you read The Onion, which is a very important scholarly source. It's a satirical newspaper, and it has a headline from uh, May of 1948, and it says, Jewish state created between, you know, Lebanon, Jordan, Egypt, whatever. And now all our problems are solved, says exultant prime minister. You know, um, I could say this in a much more fancy and scholarly way, but ultimately I believe in the real estate broker's location, location, location. And it's overdetermined. Obviously the Jewishness has something to do with it. But, um, but yeah, why is it on how that is formed in 47, 48, and how that's expressed? 
will be a point, a big point behind the book. Anyway, yeah. Um, we do have three more people who ask questions. The yeah. first one is Kobe, okay, and then Ilan, and then uh, Avi. Okay. And then Mo. Yep. Yeah, thank you. Uh, several questions I'll try to be uh, uh, brief. Uh, first one, perhaps it's a uh, another layer or, or the conclusions or another perspective which may be beneficial is uh, how these views and narratives of Israel around the world influence Israeli perspective mm -hmm. during the war, after the war, that might be another uh, another layer here. Um, one other thing that I found uh, um, interesting in a comparative way is that uh, narratives actually at their very early stages when they uh, uh, are begin to, to be crystallized who quite often I think go on to other studies of narratives like uh, Shoah, like narratives in Arab countries among Palestinians as well, we find that at early stages all sorts of things emerge that later on are mm. uh, they, they do not exist anymore, so it's a, um, it's a, it's a, pers or it's, it's, a, it's a view that we can find um, mm. in, in many narratives, in many mythologies. Uh, just one example, I think, in, in right after the, the Holocaust, between 45 and 48, uh, there were various voices uh, in uh, Eretz Israeli society, that later on, after the war, after '48, we do not we do not hear anymore. Mm -hmm. uh, so this is again a general uh, uh, perspective. And the last question or comment is that I I thought that the the question of the, the uniqueness of this case versus the similarity between this case and other cases is like a, a, an an important. Uh, element here. So why uh, Israel deserves this? Is there a, any special reason for uh, for this attitude towards Israel? Because you mentioned that interests play a major a major part, national interests, but alongside national interests perhaps there is some room. Is it a small room? Is it, a, is it an important uh, uh, weight to give to sentiments with regard to Jews, to Zionism, to Israel. Mm. Uh, thank you. Okay, Ilan, please. Mm. Well, that's a good uh, uh, opening for what my question as well. Uh, sentiment, which is just a personal emotion, which I have a great deal to it. It's not yet out, but I'm very curious about it. It's close to you. How people feel. And um, I'm curious about this notion of Hashifet, sources are journalists, good sources, and their state papers. But the place of Palestine, Israel, uh, I'll use the word the Holy Land, um, in this whole issue seems to me to be uh, something that ought not to be slighted. Mm -hmm. And I wonder, I wonder how it measures and balances the uh, sentiments, the feelings, the emotions together with you know, who's close to the Suez Canal and who's right. close to the sources of oil. That seems to me to be an important question, and that gets to just an observation. 
I've read a lot about the Rashba and what's uh, important to know about him is that he's a Muslim. Mm -hmm. And uh, that has to do with Hinduism. It's not Muslim at all. <coughs> Here he gave the Noble Dimension of the 1930s, as you pointed out. And uh, Abdul Rahman is a case in point of uh, much the dimensions of the conflict. He is an Indian diplomat at the time of the, uh, the news spoke. Mm -hmm. But he ends his life as a refugee in Pakistan. And he is really a victim to the kind of religious issues that aggravate the fight over the Holy Land. It's the only issue of partition that I know of that involves not two sides, but three sides. Mm -hmm. And it is a mistake that, well, a mistake or a misconception to see this a war between two people and two faiths is a terrible thing. chance to ask the question uh, of you at the last one and then I, I want to get back to, to discussion between you, Paula and you and also Ilan about the intensity of special case in, in world's in, uh, point of view. You said location. I beg to differ. I think the location it, it, that uh, is not the, the, the most important thing here. The Jews are the most important thing here. The, the, the centrality in in, uh, in, 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 the, in the in the in the civilizations of the, the Muslim and, and, and Christian civilizations much more important here. Israel is is, uh, is, uh, is being looked at as as a test case for uh, for many nations, I think, and was and the, and the project before, the Zionist project was also uh, 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 suffered or enjoyed this status. I think before the, the creation of the state of Israel, and the, then I want to I, I found. A, Great interest in your remark. In your, you noted that the, the pragmatist in the State uh, Department and the liberal, the pro-Zionist liberal, liberals shared the same low evaluation of, of the Arab capacity of state and nation uh, nation building for the fostering state and nation and, 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 uh, and nation building process. I think it's it's. It, it's a it's a key. It's an important key for understanding uh, the the historical process during the, the end of the forties, and even on uh, for understanding later decades, uh, uh, for understanding the attitude of the of the world vis-a-vis uh, -vis the Arab Israeli conflict. Great. Uh, I want to squeeze um, Jacob's brief question, please. Well, I mean, he, he touched my question already asked actually, but uh, just one little aspect. Uh, when you say, you know, why Israel, why, you know, Jews, whatever, I'm wondering how, uh, what how, what more information we can glean from comparing the 48 war, comparing it to other struggles, say, I don't know, of course, Oklahoma, the FLN, how international media coverage or something, how that's positioned in the world. 
further from home, something similar, the Admin, IRA, of course. And if those international narratives are formed differently or in some way, maybe that sort of just points to something different about the mm. Yeah. Wow. No, these are great questions. Uh, I don't necessarily have answers. Um, you know, one question is, how long am I going to live? <laughs> uh, and how long since I am th this year? This year I become uh, this year I become a senior citizen. So you know, we'll have to see. I'm supposed to turn in the book in um, I don't know if I'll be able to do. It. I'm supposed to turn it in, in three years because it's a trade book and they want it out by 2028. So I don't know, or I might just wind up <coughs> ignoring them and turning in when it's ready. Uh, Colby, that's a great comment about, and if you can send me references to literature about the, the you were saying about, you know, sort of this comparative view about narrative, it's, it can be quite complex in the immediate aftermath or, and then how it crystallizes or condenses or whatever. I'd be really just fascinated by that. If I do it the right way, I think that I can write about narrative for a popular audience in such a way that they won't drop off. And because my agent, when she reads my work now, she'll say, oh, this is good, good. I'm getting bored. Boring! So, um, but I think, I think it can be done because people are actually very interested in memory and forgetting and all of that. So that could be very, very important. Um, yeah, how you measure intent. No, obviously, 1948 is not the beginning. It's a point on a continuum. <coughs> and I have to introduce that at the beginning. You know, I've done some work, and we have a lot of people in the room have done work about global reception to the Balfour Declaration, the establishment of the mandate. I mean, it is. It's a big deal. Um, and there is literature about the Permanent Mandates Commission of the League of Nations and how, like, what is it, three-fourths of all the petitions they get are about Palestine. Right. So that's going on. But then you have the drama, right? This is, this is a theatrical moment, 1947, 48, 49. The drama of the United Nations, of the vote and so forth, and then the war itself. I mean, this really raises it to a whole new level. So I think you're right. There is definitely background there that I have to engage in. I, I agree with you completely also about religious sentiment. A lot of the books I'm reading now, just for secondary background, are about the churches um, in all sorts of countries, Catholic and Protestant, about the war. And, um, however, why are the churches so involved? Because the Jews are going to establish a state in Palestine. If they're going to establish a state in Manitoba, they'd have some interest so in it. Why is Palestine Palestine? Words, what grants is that location this? That well, um, Jesus. Well, yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it goes back to religious sentiment. You're absolutely right. And what's interesting is, again, if you look at the level, the sub-diplomatic level of discourse, and this is something that is a question now, not an answer, is when is that religious sentiment obvious? When do you suspect that it's latent? And when is it just not there? Right? And that's just a question. As we all know, we tell our graduate students to go into their search with questions, not with theses or hypotheses. And that's the question. I think it's be right. The religious sentiment is, is paramount. Um, in the case, no, I mean, look, in the case of the American, for example, like, in the case of the Germans, it's clear to me that it's this combination of traditional anti-Semitism, uh, Christian, I don't want to say obsession, but Christian focus on the Holy Land, and a huge amount of untapped or unapproached guilt. That's the case of the Germans. Sorry? Guilt. Yeah. Um, I'm pretty sure, but I could be wrong, that as I go through the Latin American uh, press, the problem is that the, the Christian sentiment's going to be complicated, because in Catholic countries, you know, the Vatican's anti-Zionist, right? And yet, but a lot of the people are pro. So where is that coming from? Um, so I suspect that the religious sentiment is very important, but there's a whole other aspect in the United States, developmentalism, it's like a small America. I mean, you know this stuff better than I do. So um, pioneering spirits, you know, if... If it weren't for the kibbutzim, and if, if all the Israeli, the, the Jews in Palestine were doing was living in Tel Aviv, you know, and, and Haifa or something, it, the, the romance wouldn't be there. The epic wouldn't be there. So I think, yes, religion's a part of it, but um, it, it, it's not all of it. And then, um, you know, and that's that issue of location versus Jewiness of the, of, of, of the question. Uh, yes, of course, the Zionist project that had Christian supporters from the very beginning, it's Herzl, Herzl coins the term Christian Zionism. 
Um, so, and yet at the same time, um, uh, there are obviously aspects of the Palestine issue that are specific to it, be or to it being in the Holy Land for Muslims and for Jews. Again, you know, how many Muslims would care if the Jews had established a state in Antarctica? And that's you know, established a state in Antarctica. Who would get upset? Penguins. Yeah. So. Um, it's a great, great suggestion. I don't know if I could do it, or maybe I could get like a lot of money for graduate students, but to compare, that would be a whole other book in a way, media struggle, media coverage of various conflicts. It's the kind of thing that communications people would do. Compare, and then, you know, prominence, language, terminology, discourse analysis, that would be terrific. Do you want to do it? <laughs> <laughs> so I think it's a great awesome. idea. But I'm going to think it through and think, think, I mean, all these suggestions are fantastic. And now the question is just what's possible? And as you, you, those of you who've known me for a long time know, I tend to bite off a lot when I take on a project. And I've been told with every book I've ever done, except for the last, maybe the Herzl book, um, it's too big and it will never be done. I still remember every book going to the CZA and talking to whoever the chief archivist was the time, at the time was, and lo nitan la sotza yeshu mi dai homer. I've heard that about six times. Yes, you tell me die Homer. Of course, yes, you tell me die Homer. I'll write a book, people will attack it, and then other people will write better books. So, you know, um, that's my approach. Uh, so again, graduate students, do not imitate this. You know, first book, maybe. Okay. okay. Actually, I have a question about the dialectical nature of those narratives, but yeah. you know what, since we're out of time and some people need to go and we were having lunch together. I'll okay. keep talking later. I want to just sum it up with congratulating you on this really incredibly interesting project and good luck with the book. I'm looking forward to it. Thank you. Well, I'd like to get my, he my Herzl book translated into Hebrew, so if anybody can get that done, I'd be very grateful. I have all the German originals now from the German book. Thank you.